Malaysia's weakest point is enforcement. Malaysian laws generally are um, okay lah. Uh, can upgrade it more or less is fine. It's the enforcement that is terrible because one, there are not many enforcement officers, and number two, we have a national sickness. 贪腐是一切犯罪的根源。人贩子垂涎从贩卖人口可得到的丰厚利润，萌生贪念的执法人员也可能会滥用权力，助长人口贩卖这个吃人的犯罪活动。上一集我们和大家分享了大马的人口贩卖生态，这集我们要探讨大马在打击人口贩卖时遇到了什么绊脚石。美国国务院发布二零二三年度国际贩卖人口报告，大马的评级终于脱离最低级别的第三级观察名单，升回至第二级别观察名单。但是报告也强调，贪污以及官员涉嫌共谋的情况依旧让人担忧。内部贪污问题举不胜举。截至报告发布为止，共有四十名官员因为涉嫌人口贩卖而被逮捕以及接受调查。不过，贪污问题并非打击人口贩卖的唯一阻碍，相关政府单位的执法力度也备受关注。Almost a million ringgit in three years settlement. If you put all the settlement together, almost one million ringgit in compensation for all the cases that we have managed. So when we shared this information to the government, they were quite shocked because. The Labor Department can't even do that, and the cases take forever. The Atipsum case can't even get compensation using the law. So this is also where we question the enforcement. If you look at the compensation given uh, in two victims, it's so small and so pathetic. So even though they are convictions, it means that the people who were supposed to get justice, the victims, did not get compensation properly. And we also don't know who were the people who were convicted. It could be the transporter. It may not be the main owner of the company. It may not be the director. It could be some, you know, low-level complice to the human trafficking. So we can't really conclude. The, the U.S. have flagged Malaysia a number of times. You need to have more safe spaces. You need to prosecute people. That means you have to bring more people to be brought to court to for prosecution. And number three. You need to have more enforcement officers working on this. Number one, your your police officers at the at the local level must be trained on this on some of these issues uh, and ready to equip uh, how to handle them. Wei Yan Da Zui Fan. 政府在二零二一年修正了反贩卖人口以及反贩运移民法案，刑罚从最高二十年监禁、罚款或者是两者兼施，加重至无期徒刑，另加鞭笞。刑罚是提高了，不过如何有效执法，在于前线执法人员是否有足够的人口贩卖认知和训练，拥有识别人口贩卖案件的敏感度，以及早发觉潜在的受害者，否则很有可能会对人口贩卖受害者造成二度伤害。The abuse can be mental and physical as well. That is the reason why、uh, we always mention in this work. It is very important to every individual from the time the rescue until the end, until they are reintegrated and repatriated. For every individual who are approaching to this issue, right? For example, me. For me to have the thing where you have to have the trauma-informed care. You know that skill, and、uh, you have to have in your mindset that you have to have the victim-centric approach mindset, so that it will enable you to understand the whole issue and to guide and to support the victims. 政府在二零零八年成立反贩卖人口理事会，并且成立了五个委员会，共同制定打击国内人口贩卖和移民走私的政策和计划。政府持续加强跨机构的合作，不过机构之间的协调却称不上尽善。根据二零二三年度国际贩卖人口报告，大马目前只有两名法官专门负责反人口贩卖的案件，以及一座位于曲兰莪巴生的审理人口贩卖案件的。
特别法庭。根据大马宪法，法院无法主动打击人口贩运，只能够等到案件呈堂之后，根据法律和证据来审理。这也反映了国内在处理人口贩卖相关的刑事案实的不足之处，以及出现了延迟提控的问题。If you look at the PPs now, also they are overburdened by a lot of things as well.、Uh, one day you get like ten, twenty cases,、um, one person. So I think it's really、uh, something that the government needs to be able to prioritize, to put more budget and to put more resources into AGC to make sure that they are supported by whatever that they need.、Um, and so. They are also able to prioritize human trafficking as something that、uh, is important and that needs more attention to. When we took up、uh, two Atim Som cases, the survivors were put in the the safe house for too long while waiting for their deposition, and then they were after giving the deposition in the middle of the court case. It was already almost two years. That's not even. With the verdict given, and they were sent back without any information, without proper court instruction. So our legal system in managing trafficking is highly problematic. We always think about、um, think about victims, right, as people with human rights that needs to be respected and to be treated with dignity, right. But does the government think like that? Because they would then, depending on which agency or department or ministry, for example, the National Security Department or the whole ministry will think of a victim when the, the person doesn't have a passport or a work permit as a national security threat. We have had cases before where the girl is 16 years old, but in, in that's a real age, right? But when she was arrested. Uh, in the passport, she was 22 or 23. That's a legal age to work, you know. But when we doc, when we started documenting her and getting her details from our partners in Cambodia, we were told that she was 16 years old. But unfortunately,、uh, the case she was arrested, you know, for actually,、um, uh, you know, injuring or harming an employer due to mental. Uh, abuse, right? But the trial was done based on the fact that she was an adult, not that she was a child. That when that incident happened. Want to more directly hit human trafficking? MAPO and foreign government organizations maintain close cooperation to ensure that responsible for human trafficking cases have sufficient training and support for the prosecution and prosecution of victims and victims of trafficking. They use the human rights and the focus of the victims as the center of the support. We have also started working closely with the government agencies and see how we can actually support it on a bigger scale. So what we do is we have actually、uh, spoken to some other countries where, like I told you, like we have so many uh, um, survivors from different different countries, right? So we have actually collected the data and、uh, we have partnered,、uh, we have actually communicated uh, with uh, the NGOs in the destination countries, so that it's easy for us to actually、uh, work on. Issues or individuals when they come to repatriation and reintegration process. We also have to follow the rules and guidelines of the、uh, the government agencies. Okay, so like uh, uh, the place that we did was like we have to leave them at the boarding, and then after that they、uh, they go on their own. And that's the process. But after we started doing, we partnered with the、uh, destination countries. Along the journey, we can see that we have started doing more. Like I think, maybe we, we would have done more than like maybe 300 over cases,、uh, repatriation cases.、Uh, we have actually uh, uh, done programs with them、uh, in this repatriation and reintegration、uh, 
uh, uh, program. We had uh, especially children, right? Children who have been repatriated. We actually get them into education program, uh, vocational program. So because some children who have actually passed the age of school, so what we do is uh, we get them into vocational programs, and then also after that they will actually will start doing part-time work, and then they get in touch with the family. It's a positive way of grooming them into the, uh, in the into a better lifestyle. So they don't miss their childhood. At the same time, they also learn a lot of things. So once they are successfully graduated from that particular program, then they start working in the place where it's related to the program that they have attended to. In our capacity as an NGO that's been working on this issue for about 30 years, we have partnering with the government, you know, in providing shelter, as well as you know in a number of different initiatives like the setup of our one-stop center a safe space for victims you know to under the custody of the police uh, before they are produced in the court for their interim protection order and so forth so we are trying to do some things in partnership with the government and us as a member of the national a council on anti-trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants, we are trying to see how, what more can we do together. I must acknowledge it's not an easy work to, you know, do, but it's necessary. When we are choosing to make a law, we shouldn't just point the finger at enforcement, the law, and the government anymore. You know, they are doing, to some extent, some work surrounding this, which they have never done before. So we must give credit to them, but they could improve. They could do better, for sure. Right? But it's really the Malaysians, the general public, understanding what this means and how they are being complicit in these activities. Because if, if the Malaysians themselves are not understanding an employer doing what they are doing, companies are practicing forced labor or even having, then you, you are actually encouraging while there's a group of people, including the government, trying to fight it. People just feel that human trafficking is glamour and it's an international it's a issue and it's very glamour, but it's not because I think people who are working at the grassroots level, people who directly work uh, with the survivors of human trafficking, the government agencies and as well as NGOs, will directly know the grievances that they go through. So it is not easy, it is very challenging, it is very traumatizing, not only for the survivors of human trafficking, it is also very challenging and traumatizing for the people who are working closely in that issue of human trafficking. So it is good for all of us individuals in Malaysia to understand the issue, to educate everyone. When you talk about human trafficking, it is indeed quite complicated and it's very hard to explain so um, what we are fighting with uh, essentially is like uh, for example on the social media space right we want to be able to tell compelling stories we want to be able to tell people about uh, why this is happening and things like that but for us to um, communicate that on social media or even on our programs as well, it is very difficult to concise everything into something that's simple and something that people can understand easily. I think that's one thing that uh, we do face uh, that struggle as well. Um, I think the other thing is also because there's just so much of priorities around us, um, whether it is uh, making sure that academically students are doing well in school or that there are bureaucracy in schools that you know people need to face or teachers need to face and things like that and so uh, human trafficking as an issue obviously you know takes really a back seat to uh, try to understand a little bit better we we do face some kind of reluctance um, among uh, the public to want to learn a little bit more about human trafficking as well I do think in the years to come, there are different opportunities available 
that for us to work with the government. But I think while we are able to do that and there is some consistency in the work that we are doing with them, the other biggest challenge, as I mentioned, is to educate the public. Because it cannot be just with the government. Then we are not doing things with the public and this is where public I mean, public advocacy comes in, right? It's not, while we are working on policy advocacy in one angle, public advocacy is also important. So I do believe that different approaches um, uh, yield different results. And so um, I'm not saying that, you know, the negative approach or telling people like, you know, what human trafficking is and that it's very, it's, it's not improving and things like that it doesn't work. Um, I just think that there are different approaches and like if your approach works for your community, uh, that is great. Uh, so it needs to have a multi-pronged approach where uh, some of us are doing things uh, where we pressure and that, you know, uh, we look at things and, and we make sure that, you know, we are highlighting the negative part of things and stuff like that. In terms of our organisation, we like to look into more positive reinforcement, right? That kind of positive reinforcement also help give a bit of hope to people to say that, you know, um, even though there are so many of these things that are happening, let's look at, uh, you know, what has evolved over the years already last time. We don't really talk about human trafficking. Now, you guys are at our office talking about human trafficking. So, you know, that is really like the improvement that we want to be able to see and highlight and encourage more of that in the future. So you can see there might be uh, perpetrators everywhere. You know, it's not only in the in the airport or in the in the along the journey. So that is the reason why the awareness on human trafficking is very important. Like when uh, when you see a child sitting in a restaurant, and uh, and uh, a guy is sitting beside the child, the awareness is important because by looking at the scenario itself, you can actually gauge: is the child belongs to him? Is he is he really the father? Are they the real parents why is the child sitting in this direction why the child looks sad and uh, why this different facial expression that kind of stuff so um, the awareness and the experience and the knowledge I think every individuals in Malaysia have to take time to go and study to understand how it works